Hello, hello, hello. It's now 7 p.m. on Wednesday, November the 8th, and I want to welcome you all again to the fourth annual UCSB Natural Reserve System Fall Virtual Seminar Series. My name is Andrew Brooks, and I will be your moderator for tonight's presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and I encourage you all to join us again next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for the last seminar in our series this fall, when we'll virtually visit the UCNRS Santa Cruz Island Reserve for an exciting presentation on the bats of Santa Cruz Island. Before I kick off tonight's program, I'd like to briefly go through a bit of housekeeping again. The presentation portion of tonight's seminar will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes. We've set aside the remaining 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for any questions that you all might have for tonight's presenter. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little button labeled Q&A. You can click on that button and then type your questions into the text window. I'll be monitoring the questions during tonight's presentations, so please feel free to type in your questions at any time. With that sorted, I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Christina Sandoval, the director of the UCSB administered coal oil point reserve. Chris will present a brief history of the reserve and then she'll also serve as tonight's featured speaker. So take it away, Chris. And uh, welcome everybody, good evening. I am sure uh, that you could have been doing a lot of fun things tonight and thank you for choosing to be here instead. And I hope you have a beer or a glass of wine with you. So today I'm gonna give you an introduction about the Coal Point Reserve and then I'll tell you a story about how and why we have a snowy plover program. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that I manage today is the traditional territory of the Chumash people who lived and cared for this land for thousands of years before the European occupation. So in this slide, you can see uh, the a map of California with all the reserves from the UC Natural Reserve System. And the arrow is showing where Coal Point Reserve is, or Pukoi, as the Chumash called it. And uh, our mission is to support research, education, public outreach, and stewardship. And uh, some of these uh, things, like research and education, is very easy because Coal Point is on the left side of this point, and UCSB on the right side of that point, we're very close to UCSB, only four miles. So it's very easy for researchers and students to come to Coal Point Reserve. When it comes to stewardship, it's a little bit of a challenge. As you can see, Coal Point Reserve's in the middle of an urban area. Here's another uh, view, a little bit more focused in. Uh, Coal Point has one mile of beach, and to the west, we have the Elwood Bluffs, which are now protected. And to the north, we have the North Campus Open Space, also owned by UCSB and uh, managed by the Cheeto Center, and Lisa Stratton is the director there. And uh, I don't work alone. I work with a lot of people, but I have uh, some... Uh, is, Full-time staff that work with me, uh, Jessica Gray and now Kaya, who always comes with her to work. And Armando Aispuro is our new uh, plover uh, biologist. And uh, Tony Nelson is our IT person. I really appreciate all the wonderful work that they do. The reserve is sort of small compared to the other reserves on the natural reserve system. But uh, even though it's a small, it has some wonderful habitats. So it, within 170 acres, we have coastal scrub vegetation, uh, the Deverest Loo, which is a seasonal uh, tidal marsh, vernal pools, uh, bluffs, and salt flats and dune ponds. And believe it or not, all of these habitats have different assemblages of species. So our diversity, the diverse biodiversity at Coal Point Reserve is pretty high for a small reserve. We've just started to cataloging everything and we already over a thousand species. We now have a nature center. That's our newest acquisition since 2017. We have this beautiful building 
that hosts a variety of groups that are working uh, on the reserve classes, researches or researchers or groups. And it's a really nice building. I hope you can visit sometime. So going through the type, our main mission, uh, this is a map showing the plots of uh, past or current uh, research projects. Just to give you an idea about how widespread they are, there's also quite a few on in the intertidal zone. Pretty much the whole reserve is occupied by research. Um, in fact, it's uh, one of the main reasons that Coal Point even came to existence is because in the 70s, <clears throat> well, the university purchased this land in the 60s, but in the 70s, faculty started using this area to bring classes and to do research, and they realized how valuable it was. So they petitioned to the university to make it at a reserve and incorporate it to the natural reserve system. So here's an example of kind of research uh, being done where people are sampling the fish on the Deverest Loop, uh, particularly trying to see, uh, to detect presence or absence of an endangered species of fish, the tidewater goby. And here's a group uh, with a bunch of students showing how to monitor the intertidal zone with transects. Um, there is several research projects going on in the intertidal zone and this area has been monitored for decades. This is incredibly useful during the oil spill because we, the oil spill in 2015 when it reached Coal Point Reserve uh, we wanted to know is the oil impacting the zone and there was all this beautiful baseline data already present that we could compare with the years following the oil spill. And the students come here with classes, but they also come here to be in terms at Coal Point Reserve. They have a blast. They love to get out of the classroom and to be outdoors. You just see them just how, how satisfied they are to be here. And the students learn uh, work skills when they are here. They gain confidence and they are more prepared for a career. There's a, a few recent research that have shown a really important role of um, field classes. Uh, based on two separate research, one showing that underrepresented students in science and engineering are more likely to switch majors before graduation. But then a follow-up research showed that when these students have field experience through classrooms or internships, uh, that kind of gap disappears and they are in equal numbers staying uh, graduating in their favorite major. That shows how important it is that the reserve system continues to attract and to support uh, class and undergraduate student use. And for Coal Point in particular, because we're so close to campus, the students can participate um, on these various projects that we, we have, even within classes, just jump on their bike and they come to the reserve and spend an hour or two and learn a lot doing that. And some of these students uh, do an entire thesis, like a senior thesis on the reserve. And uh, this might be most likely their first research project that they can do from the very beginning to the end. The reserve is also used uh, for the art, for arts. Here's Hank Pitcher, uh, factory advisor for the reserve, and he's been painting Coil Point for a very long time, and his paintings are a record of the history of the reserve. You can see on his paintings the difference 20, 30 years ago and now. It helps that this is a amazingly gorgeous place. Just look at this, this uh, uh, photo right here. Uh, it's just a beautiful reserve. So now I'm gonna to talk to you more about uh, the snowy plovers and this program that uh, we have had for a long time and you probably have heard about it. It always started with Mark Holmgren. Mark is a birder 
and uh, he is always wearing those clothes, that hat, and that particular scope. And he's always doing exactly what you see on that picture. So when I was starting my job, nine, 1998, it was a long time ago, uh, he came to me from the Santa Barbara Audubon Society and said, um, Hey, Chris, I know you're starting this job, and uh, I want you to know that you have a very rare species of bird on your reserve. And uh, did you know that? And I said, no, I study insects. I know nothing about birds. And then he said, well, you should know, you should learn, because these guys are have recently been listed as threatened, and I think you could do something about it. Well, that little short conversation changed a lot in me and it triggered two things my maternal instincts because they said they were threatened and need help and a challenge i love challenges and i love to fix things and so that's how it all started so i started learning about snowy plovers i learned that they were steadily declining there were only about 1,300 birds left in the Pacific coast. Most breeding sites had been lost. And by lost, I mean recreation, dredging, manipulations of beaches, all sorts of different things. There were also loss of wintering sites, which is sites where the plovers hang out when they're not nesting. So they were listed as threatened in 1993, not much before I started my job. And the U.S. Fish and Life Service plan identified the causes of the decline and proposed some solutions. So there was a roadmap about where to go. But before I want to teach you a little bit about the natural history, which might be old news for you, but I uh, want to make sure that everybody knows. First, they are the most adorable, cute, cute birds out there. And uh, they have two very distinct phases. In the fall and winter, they flock in groups. They're very friendly with each other. And they congregate in a few sites along the coast. In the spring and summer, the males become territorial. They fight with each other. They choose a mate and they pair and they choose a place to have a nest. They're very interesting species because um, the males attract the females. They just dig a few holes here and there, maybe sometimes five holes or 10 sometimes. And the female goes and she sits on each hole and she tries them all and she picks one. And if she likes him, uh, they will mate and they will start laying eggs in a few days. Both of them take care of the eggs, one during the day, the other during the night. But when the chicks hatch, she takes off to find another guy and he takes care of the chicks. All of this is a two month ordeal. One month, take care of the chicks, uh, one month to incubate the eggs. So it's a big commitment for a bird. Most birds raise chicks much faster than that. Chicks are absolutely adorable. As soon as they hatch, in a few hours, they are running around and trying to, to pick up food on the beach by themselves. They're all fuzzy. They don't have full feathers yet, so they get really cold. The most important job of the dead is to keep them warm. That's why they're tucked in under the dead like this. They always tuck their face and uh, you see these dads with a whole bunch of legs because there could be three chicks there, so be eight legs total. And uh, when they start growing up, like this little chick here alone is a bit of a teenager, they're starting to develop some feathers and they sometimes can practice fly, even though there's no way he's gonna jump in the air with that tiny little wing. So, um, at Coil Point, uh, we had only wintering plovers. The plovers have not been breeding there for 30 years. And um, so, as you can see here in 2001, when we started this project, there was a pretty good population of about 150 plovers. And it continues to be a pretty good population since then. 
And birders love to count birds, so it's great because we have all these data sets available to us. So we decided to protect those wintering birds that Mark told us we should. So Kevin decided to do um, a project. Kevin is my husband, also a biologist at USGS. So we decided to do some research to find out uh, what, what is causing problems to plovers at Coal Point Reserve. As you can see, it's really tough work. You sit on the beach and you watch the plovers and you start recording. Uh, every time a plover gets disturbed by somebody, uh, they record uh, who was it, like dog, a person, a bird, how far was the plover from that, that thing that disturbed it. And what did it do? Did it fly or did it run away? Did it stop eating? Just trying to understand what's the conflict here. And the, you might imagine what the conflict was. And now, so here's a sunny beach day at Coral Point Reserves in 2000 when there was no habitat protection. In fact, you couldn't even do research on a day like that because there wouldn't be any plovers. They would have flown away to a different beach for the day and they might come back when the beach is not so crowded. So the results of this, this uh, observations that they did show that, that half of the disturbances, the white half of the bar, the, the circle, was caused by humans just walking through a plover flock. So people sunbathing or jogging or whatever. A quart of that was caused by crows and another quart by dogs. Now, when you realize that crows are an anthropogenic problem, there's so many crows in Goleta all over the place because of people, because of the food that is available to them, you realize the vast majority of the disturbance, almost this entire circle is caused by people. In a way, this is good news because we can work with people. We can manage people. So um, we continue then to study people to find out um, what were they doing? Uh, why did they come to the Coal Point Reserve? Are there certain activities that are not as compatible and others that are okay? So the survey of beach users showed that most people are there walking and jogging or sunbathing or surfing. All of those things are really cool. Um, watching sunset parties, a bit of a problem. Beach cleanup is great. Dog walk, well, depend if the dog is on a leash or not. Bird watching, painting, ride horses. Most people were students. Great, we have the university. We can reach out to students on the university. But now the literacy of birds is pretty low. 98% of people could not identify a snowy plover when given several photo, photos of birds. And a majority of them also didn't know the area was a reserve. That is totally on us, right? So we were not having good signage or good information available to people. That's definitely something we can fix. Kevin also measured the density of the snowy plover throughout the entire mile off the beach. The dark blue line here shows the higher concentration of plovers and lighter shades of blue are smaller concentrations. So we can see on this figure that plovers really like to hang out right by this blue mouth. That is good news because people like to hang out right by the entrance to Sands Beach. So there wasn't a complete overlap between the two. So we created a goal, we, we uh, decide on a goal to protect the winter roost while maintaining public access. We thought that the best model would be one that protect the most amount of plovers while disturbing the least amount of people. So we thought about several actions that needed to be uh, done. One is to put a rope fence around the high concentration area of plovers. The other one, do you see that Delta trail with a white arrow coming straight into the middle of the, the roost? That trail needed to be closed. 
So we closed that trail and routed people to the main entrance to the reserve. Uh, we also put signs and we initiated a docent program. We also restored the dunes. So this is what the initial road fence looked like, protecting the area where the plovers like to be. Um, this is a before and after restoration. The, the dunes around that area were completely covered in acacia, which is uh, an exotic weed. And the photo below is the dunes after restoration. Snowy plovers do not like bushes because predators can hide inside. So restoration was an important step to take. Um, we had several educational signs to start teaching people about plovers, about the reserve, and how they can help. And we also initiated a docent program, uh, which is people, students, and community volunteers hanging out by the beach and, beach and just chatting with people on one-to-one. -one. And everything was going well. Then one day, my friend uh, Adrian here seeing very proud of his new bird bath next to the nature center. He said, Chris, um, let's go do some bird watching on the Devereux Slough mouth. And um, I politely agree um, just, you know, just to be nice because I'm not a birder, but there we went there. And he said, uh, I think I see a snowy plovers. Now, if you remember, plovers do not hang out at Coal Point in the summertime at that time. They go away. And I thought he was losing or something. So I did not really believe. And then he kept looking and he said, I think I see two chicks. At that time, I grabbed the binocular from his hand and I looked and there he goes, the cutest thing, this tiny, tiny little things running around next to a plover on this slew mouth. And it was, I just can't describe to you the emotion of that moment. It was that a mixture of things of responsibility, urgency, and excitement, because now we knew that there was hope that Coal Point Reserve could restore a breeding site. Everybody had told us, this is not done. This has never been done. Once you lo lost the breeding site, it will not happen again. And there we go. That's all the encouragement that we needed. So we quickly um, took care of those chicks. They hatch. We put some people together to brainstorm and figure out how we're going to do this. We had no money. We just had a bunch of people, but a very strong heart towards that goal. So Kevin decided, okay, I can continue the research and monitoring. Santa Barbara Audubon said that we can do the outreach and the education part with docents, lectures, social media. And as for a point, UCSB could do the management. We, together, we had to get permits, do planning, write reports, put signs, fences, and enforcement. So... Now that we have chicks, we need more research. So Kevin did another research that asked, would plovers survive, plover nests survive a coal point reserve if there was no fence, no protection? So he put this really clever experiment. He got quail eggs that you buy in the supermarket and you make little pretend nests like that one on the left there. And, um, at three eggs, you make a little hole like plovers do, and you put all over the beach, and you put them inside of the fence and outside of the fence. And you just every day go back there and you see if the egg is still there or if it got trampled. And what he found out is there was a 10% daily chance of trampling outside of the fence. Well, it takes 30 days for the 28 days for the eggs to hatch. So there was no way we could have um, nesting, successful nesting at the reserve unless there was a pretty good fence. So we then we already had a fence, but then we decided, okay, this fence needs to be good and might need to increase depending where the plovers nest. This is really visual what this research 
that he did is talking about, look at the footprints outside of the fence and inside of the fence. There's not a square inch of sand that is not trampled over a weekday. And here's a photo, you can see the plover in the bottom there uh, and a person walking. This is to show that even though we have a fence, the fence is only for the birds that are taking a nap and resting in the middle of the day or they're nesting. But when they're hungry, they have to get out of the fence. They have to go towards the ocean where the wet kelp is, the kelp rack, to pick up those uh, beach hoppers and uh, kelp flies. That's what they need to eat. So the area that needs to be protected is not just inside of the fence, but outside of the fence as well. So the program today has changed quite a bit. Um, it's now fully funded by UCSB and we get grants as well to support undergraduates uh, with internships. We get about 30 paid internships or students um, per year to become docents, plus a whole bunch of volunteers. Uh, we have a full-time docent coordinator and monitor. There's almost a thousand docents that have worked with us since 2001, and there is a seven day week docent presence. And uh, so, several of those students that became docents with us and helped us monitor, now they have careers in plover management. And we are really proud of that function that we do. Um, and this result even surprised us. This is the number of nests since the very beginning. So look at 2001-0. In four years, look at 2005, we had 60 nests. In four years, the snowy plover population was able to become fully recovered. I don't know how they do this. Think about it. How are they telling each other? I think the plovers must have a language or gossip and they talk to each other because it's not just the babies that were born there. There couldn't be enough. I think they're telling each other, seeing each other, hey, this place is safe now. You can ask here. This was a, a pretty interesting result. And one of the things that we learned, um, and I myself included because I was an insect person and went to the beach to recreate, nothing else, is that the beach is a habitat and it's not just any habitat is an incredibly rare and precious habitat. When you think about the entire globe being mostly composed of big land masses and big chunks of ocean, there is this skinny little land, a piece of land between the ocean and the land that is the coast. And some of that coast has beaches, not all. So think about how rare beaches are. And the wildlife that lives on these beaches, like all these plants that you see right there growing on the dunes, don't grow anyplace else, only on the dunes. And in the dunes, there's all these other species that also are unique to that ecosystem. Globos, dune beetles, hile beetle, uh, ludica maculata spiders, all these things out there. And what the Snowy Plover program did that we didn't expect is that it became an umbrella program to protect an entire ecosystem that is very worthy of protection. This figure here shows uh, every dot is a nest that, that ha happened at the reserve. It shows that the plovers are interested in breeding everywhere. If there is a fence around them, they will breed on that area. It's a good habitat for them. So I wanna show you now a few videos of um, uh, stuff that happens during management. See, I, I want the students looking at this webinar today to see that what is like to be a manager. It's, it's not uh, anything mysterious. You just deal with stuff as they happen and you do a lot of Googling. So here I am, one day there was a nest right here 
the day before and I'm looking around like, what the heck? Where did that nest go? It was here yesterday. So what happened here is that um, this eggs got buried because we had a really strong wind yesterday. They were only two days from hatching. So I think I can save them. So those eggs um, were then brought to the Santa Barbara Zoo who now has amazing facilities for raising snowy plovers. They keep them there for 30 days. And when the plovers have full wings and are able to fly, they can be released back at Coal Point Reserve. And uh, release day is really fun. Here's Jessica carrying some chicks ready to be released and her own little cub, not to be released yet, not for another probably 20 years. And uh, here is a group of people, release day is really fun. A lot of people come to watch, it's so nice to see the plovers get their first flight. They, some of them just fly nonstop. You think they're drop out of the sky tired. Um, this guy here with the big camera is uh, Bill Crow. Just to give you an example of the dedication, Bill comes here every week, once a week, all the way from LA to count snowy plovers and record their band combinations. And he has an incredible memory for bands, so he can tell us this story. Oh, this bird, Anne, she last year, uh, she lost her nest from Tide, but this year she's trying again with this guy. So she, he knows everybody by name. So um, one thing we did one year, a couple of times, is that we were having really high disturbance, or not disturbance, a predation by crows and by skunks. Those are typical predators of urban areas. And there was just, we're gonna have no plover chicks if we didn't do something. So we had this crazy idea to take the real eggs away from the parents and we give them wood eggs. And you can see Jessica there painting the wood eggs that we got at Michael's. And we put the wood eggs under the plover and we keep the real eggs in the incubator. And then when the eggs are ready to hatch, we replace them back. So that way, if a skunk tries to eat it, it will chew on a wood egg and will let go and we don't lose the nest. And of course, all of those things need to be permitted with the Fish and Life Service. So how do we know the egg is ready to hatch? So here's a video showing that egg stock. <laughs> so uh, after this, we need to return the, uh, those chicks and eggs to the beach and we have to return them very quickly because if we wait too long, the plovers don't accept. So um, it's a very time consuming uh, strategy because you have to be surveilling the eggs every day, several times a day and the night. So here is um, Jessica bringing the real eggs and the chick back to the nest. Now, let me tell you, this plover is not a normal plover. Her name is Nice Lady because she is not afraid of us.
So um, now, if you think that you want my job, I wanted to show you that my job is not always very fun. So here we are testing electrified quail eggs. So the idea here was to uh, get some quail eggs and uh, to scare the skunks away and teach them a lesson, don't eat clover eggs. When they touch those two wires, they get a shock and they stay away. Shock is a very effective way to keep mammals out of things. They even work on big cows, so it must work on skunks. So here we go. <laughs> Not very fun, I remember that day. So um, I really want you guys to come over here and there's many different ways that you, you can get involved in the reserve. Um, you can uh, visit our website, Instagram and Facebook. We're always posting natural history news there. Uh, we have a guided tour the first Saturday of each month and uh, volunteer or support the reserve. There's so many ways to volunteer. If you like weeds, we can find a weed patch for you. Or if you like plovers, you can come help us. And uh, please get in touch and share your ideas. And I, I wanna thank some very special people that have been with us for a very long time. There are just too many people to thank. So I just uh, put some that have been with us for so long. So. Bill Adosan, he hears me complaining about skunks and other things, and he, he took this to heart, this challenge, and he told his mechanic that to build him a plover egg that would have a spring inside, so when the skunk touch it, it will pop up and scare the skunk. We could even be put some confetti or something inside. So here he is, so proud, showing his beautiful pop eggs. Uh, in the bottom we have there Steve Ferry who was a docent for more than 10 years. He was the longstanding docent with us. And Darlene Chirma, mentor and also is still supporter of the reserve. And Rick, you will see Rick every day. He volunteers here seven days a week and does everything. So if the reserve is pretty, it's because of Rick. And I also wanna do a big thank you to UCSB. You know, if it wasn't for UCSB support, we could never have done this. They supported, allowed us these crazy ideas to, to continue and provide funding for us to continue the Plover program. And the Santa Barbara Audubon who first told us um, what we need to be paying attention to and help support and get us, us off the ground. Fish and Life Service always been providing information through the meetings with all the plover managers. We learn a lot from them. And USGS through Kevin, who did all this research. And California Coastal Commission have provided permits and allowed us to do all these things. And huge number of UCSB uh, students and volunteers who have helped us. We often have about 50 students and volunteers at, at any time. And this community, Goleta community has actually been amazing because we did a, we asked a lot from this community. We asked people to change behavior. We asked them to, walk closer to the ocean edge, leash your dog, um, avoid being close to the fence and sunbathe on this side or on that side. And people are so cool. We talk to them and they say, oh, thanks for letting me know. I didn't know. And uh, we, this idea that we have that we can share the beach is only possible when the community is receptive. So thank you everybody. And now, I would love to hear some questions from you and ideas as well, and receive some input from you. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let Andy pick that up. Yeah, that was great, Chris. And you have a long list of questions here. Um, right. 
So I'm going to start at the beginning, to be fair. And Rob Miller has asked, how do tar balls and other effects of natural and anthropogenic oil seeps and weeks affect the snowy plover and its habitat? A great question. We definitely have tar here and sometimes more than others. Uh, once we've seen a chick stuck on a tar ball and de dead, the tar ball was huge, or what about this big? Usually if the tar is small, it gets stuck on their toes or sometimes beak, but not much, it goes away. But during the oil spill, we did see bigger blotches on the plovers. Several people actually have been asking if you could show that chart of nesting success again. Uh, Micah Ashford asked how many nests were found at Co Oil Point in 2023, and a couple of other folks have asked to see that graph again. Okay, let me share my screen. This one? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so 2023, we had about, what, 63, 64 nests? Approximately, I'm just guessing, uh, I said 69 nests. It was a pretty good year, amazingly good compared to um, what I was expecting because remember that rain, the storms that we had in January and February, they completely destroyed the beach. The beach was so narrow. We were not expecting a good year, but the plovers figured it out. Great. Um, let's see. Kylie Malone has asked, what has been the biggest challenge you faced while working at Coil Point Reserve? Oh, that's a wonderful one. Let me stop share to focus on that question. <laughs> the biggest challenge, um, keep my emotion level, keep the cool. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes you get really attached to the plovers because you're working with them every day and you're watching them grow. It becomes like part of you. It's like having a dog, you know, get attached. And then comes a predator and eats a whole bunch of them. Oh my God, it's so hard to bounce back. Thanks for my family. You see many times me coming home like, oh, what happened? And they say, think about the 10 year data, you know, and, and it is true. Uh, it is important, I think, to, for me, my heart is a huge motivation for what I do. It gives me the courage to do a lot of things that really matter to me, and I don't care how many hours are working a day. But at the same time, is that heart that makes me want to give up sometimes <laughs> because it can be painful. So finding that balance I think it was a difficult thing, but I feel that I've gotten it. It took about 15 years. I think I only gotten the last five years. <laughs> okay, and, and this question has come from more than one person. Um, can you share more about who the docents are? Are they mostly students? Are they retirees? How do people become docents? Mm -hmm. The majority are students. We have a lot of students from the Environmental Studies Department, EMB, but some other departments as well, particularly undecided students that are trying to figure out what they wanted to do. Sometimes a field experience like this really helps them decide. Um, I'd say maybe 20% of our docents are from the community. Um, it's great to have folks from the community because they can outreach to other parts of the community that I don't know how to outreach. And they tend to be great docents. Okay, um, Micah Ashford has asked, what's the fledging success rate at Coil Point Reserve? And what is the hatch success rate with nests that utilize the wooden eggs? Ah. The hatching rate with the uh, eggs that have been kept in the incubator is the same as um, the native eggs that have been raised by the parents. There's a small failure. We get a few percent, maybe two, three percent of eggs um, are infertile. 
And if you see plovers mating, you realize why it's not an easy thing. But the, there is no effect of being in the incubator that we've noticed. And what was the other question? Um, what's the overall fledging success? It varies a lot. Um, we had years that the fledging success was like 10%, but uh, our typical fledging success is above one chick per male. So the way we measure that a population is succeeding is a, a plover adult has to produce at least one fledged chick per year for the population to at least be maintained or grow. If it's less than that, then the population is a sink. We only had, I think, two years where our population produced less than that, but most years we're producing a lot more per male. Uh, Leslie Sokolow wanted to know, how easy is it for visitors to see plover nests from the outside of the fence looking in? Very easy. Um, it, this is probably the only place that you can come and see plover nests, plover chicks, them feeding, them doing their own thing. We get birders from all over the world coming here just for that. It's important, though, that you um, pay attention to how close you are. If you see that they run away from you, you got to close. So the best way that I find to observe nests and chicks is I see them from far away and I stay put and they slowly come close to you and go feed. If you're quiet in one spot, they can come really close to you. Okay, now someone named Bella Lafferty, I don't yeah. know where I know that name, uh, wants to know, do you have any advice for grads considering a career in ecology, specifically reserve management? Anything you wish you could have told your younger self? Uh -huh. For me, um, I knew I wanted to be a biologist and be in nature since I was a very small kid. My mom told me that when I was 10, I said I had to graduate quick to save the world. So it was in me. It, I don't know how that my sisters are not like that. It was some sort of gene defect. <laughs> so um, for me, uh, I just kept pursuing, 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 trying to find a job where I can do what I wanted to do. I can't imagine another job that I'm not doing that. But I think for most people, uh, from what I hear talking to my students, sometimes people don't know what they wanted to do. They're still trying to figure it out. But the one advice I give is to be patient. When I got this job at UCSB, it wasn't really a job. They let me stay there on a 400 square foot trailer without pay from the 1960s trailer, riding fast. <laughs> and I had one, one year old and I was eight months pregnant. So it wasn't a very noble thing according to the standards of today's society, but I didn't care. For me, it was amazing. What, I get to manage this beach? It doesn't matter that I'm in this situation now. So be patient because um, things can change and you can create your own job. Like I stayed there without a salary. Eventually there was a salary. So you just have to show, hey, look what I can produce for you. Look look what I can contribute to this reserve. And then people will see it. A couple people have asked uh, about some information regarding your tours. So what is the starting time for the first Saturday tour? When do they start? Do they go all year? Ah. It goes all year except holidays. Um, the best way to get the time right and uh, uh, any holidays or exceptions will be to go to our web website. There is a tab called visiting and there is information there about the tours. And it's a guided tour that goes all the way around the reserve. If you have a large group, let's say a classroom, or you wanted to do a retreat for your company, uh, get in touch with us because we can also schedule special tours outside of the Saturday tour. 
A couple of other people have asked uh, for information on when do the plovers arrive on Southern California beaches? When do they nest? And somebody else asked uh, a timing question to, oh, when is the best uh, time of the day to see them? When's the best time for birding at Coal Point to see plovers? Huh. Here's the best thing, anytime. There's plovers at Coal Point Reserve every day of the year. It's a sure sighting, even if you're doing a long trip from another country. Uh, but get in touch with us because we can um, take you closer to them. So you can see plovers all year long, any time of the day. Uh, we ask people not to visit the reserve at night because it's easy to step on, on chicks if it's breeding season. To see plover chicks, uh, the best time is May, June, July. Um, uh, the breeding season it starts officially March 15, but often we don't get nests that early because the beach might be eroded and it's too stormy. And nests start too early, tend to wash away with the tides. But May, June, July, it's almost certain that you see plover chicks and nests. Uh, John Stratton wants to know, can we volunteer any day? Any day. <laughs> <laughs> How many days you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, question from Cody. How recently was the attempt with the electrified quail eggs? And did the skunks learn their lesson? I'm kind of curious <laughs> about that, too. <laughs> well, that was um, last year, last summer. So not this year, summer, last year, summer. So it worked and it didn't. See, this is what happened. The, to create a currency, you need a wet background. So uh, the, the legs of the animal is a ground. So I had to make the surface wet. But when I made the sand wet, the eggs with its moisture also start shorting the wires. Mm -hmm. So we have to reinvent that, but it did work. We got on video a, a skunk coming close and moving out of it. So I, we still have to develop this. There's an engineer out there listening to this. Please uh, give us some ideas. How can I stop the eggs from shorting uh, the two wires? Yeah, we have time for just a couple more. Um, how about how large is the plover population now and how far does their habitat extend now? We have about one mile off the beach. Um, the habitat extends, there's that area where people hang out in the entrance to Sands Beach, and then the habitat extends all the way to the end of the reserve on the other end, the west end. And uh, what was the other question? Um, you, how large is the plover population now? About 125. This time of the year, it fluctuates. If we have a big storm, let's say if we have an El Nino this year, like people say we're going to have, some pocket beaches just disappear, and then we can get a big chunk of plovers coming to winter here. So it varies from year to year. Um, and I saved this one for last because we're almost out of time. We have about five minutes left. But uh, Bill wants to know, what does the future hold for Coal Oil Point Reserve? <laughs> Great question. Um, I really hope that um, I think we have so many people now invested on the reserve and and loving the wildlife that is here and the scenery and everything that, you know, whether I'm here or not, um, I think all these good things are going to continue. I am a little worried about climate change, but because um, we are seeing some beach erosion that is making the beach narrower. But at the same time, we have such beautiful dune system that is really wide that there is space for the beach to migrate inland. So it's not like a beach backed by buildings, so there would be no escape for, for the plovers. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. There were uh, several other questions. I'm sorry if we didn't have a chance to get to everybody's question, 
but I did post the uh, web address for the Coil Point Reserve website. So if you're interested in learning more, please visit their website um, or just drop on by the reserve. You can probably find Chris wandering around on the beach somewhere. Um, sure. That's it. That's it for tonight's webinar. Uh, again, I want to thank Chris and I want to encourage everyone to attend next week's seminar. So Wednesday night at seven for the very last one for this fall, uh, when again, we'll be learning about the bats of Santa Cruz Island. So please join us then. Uh, for people that are looking for more information on the UC Natural Reserve System as a whole, so all 41 reserves throughout the state of California, or for more information on the UCSB managed NRS reserves, so not only Coil Point, but Carpinteria, Salt Marsh, Sedgwick, Santa Cruz Island, uh, the Ken Norris Rancho Marino Reserve, and then the two reserves up on the eastern uh, side of the Sierra, the Valentine Camp and the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. So you can find information on all of those reserves on the UCSB NRS website, and I've given the address uh, for that. And then of course, uh, if you wanna recommend this presentation to any of your friends, uh, it's been recorded and we'll be uploading it to YouTube in the next couple days. So uh, take yourself to YouTube, type UCSB NRS into the search box on YouTube and we should be the first thing that pops up. Uh, you'll not, not only be able to see tonight's presentation, but you'll be able to see uh, every presentation made during the last four years of the virtual seminar series. So check those out. Um, with that, I'll say good night. Chris, thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.